So greetings. Uh, my name is Susanna Clark. I'm the director of the Mahindra Humanities Center uh, here at Harvard. And my other role at Harvard is I'm also the Morton B. Knopfel Professor uh, of Music. Um, the symposium that we're having over the next uh, two days uh, called When the Prisoners Ran uh, Walpole 50 Years Later uh, is pretty much exactly to the day um, the 50 year um, anniversary, as it were, of the period from March 15th to May 19th, uh, 1973, which was the period during which the National Prisoner Reform Association, or the NPRA, was the main governance at uh, Walpole. Um, we have many exciting guests over the next uh, couple of days, um, and lots of very important things uh, to discuss, and it's a true honor for us to have everyone who is joining us, both uh, the members of our audience as well as our speakers, and indeed, uh, thank you to those of you who are online joining us as well. Uh, for the Mahindra Center, uh, this series, this symposium is part of the uh, abolition series, which examines how the humanities, that is history, language, storytelling, and the imagination, informs the activism and vision of movement uh, leaders. We are accompanied by many co-sponsors um, across our community, and so I'm going to mention them all. Uh, it's the American Friends Service Committee, uh, the Committee on Degrees in History and Literature, Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Ethics, the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, Harvard Prison Legal Assistance Project, the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, Inequality in America Initiative, the Institute to End Mass Incarceration, the Mindich Program in Engaged Scholarship, the C Program in Criminal Justice Policy and Management, and the W.E. Du Bois Department of Afro-American Studies at UMass Amherst. So as you can see, this is a, a real collective enterprise in this very uh, important area. I would also like to thank Mary McKinnon, who is the events coordinator at the Mahindra Humanities Center, as well as Charlotte Whitman, who is the program and events assistant at the Mahindra Center, and the other outstanding staff that we have, as well as my executive director, Steve Beal. Uh, without further ado, I shall hand it over for the more formal introduction uh, by Thomas uh, Dichter, who's been tremendous in bringing this event together. He's a lecturer in history and uh, literature. His own research and teaching focuses on incarceration, race, and state-sanctioned violence in the United States since the 19th century. Uh, prior to moving uh, to Boston, he was a member of uh, Decarcerate Pennsylvania Grassroots Coalition, working to end mass incarceration in Pennsylvania. He's done uh, much besides, and further ado, without further ado, I would like to now introduce you to him. So thank you for coming, and uh, thank you for supporting this wonderful event. Cheers. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here tonight as we open this symposium marking the 50th anniversary of the National Prisoners Reform Association, NPRA takeover of the Massachusetts State Prison in Walpole. 50 years ago this month, the prison guards at Walpole went on strike. They were calling for the resignation of John O. Boone, a reformer who saw, shr who saw shrinking the prison population as his main objective and the first black commissioner of correction in Massachusetts history. When the guards union walked off the job, the prisoners newly formed labor union stepped right in. They already kept the institution running. Over the next two months, they would maintain an unprecedented peace, grounded in the powerful unity and self-determination that organizing across racial lines had made possible. Tonight and tomorrow, we will hear from people who lived through this on the inside and the outside of the walls. This is their story. I would like to take a moment to thank some individuals who have helped make this gathering possible. I would like to thank the Mahindra Humanities Center, including Professor Clark, Steve Beal, and especially Mary McKinnon, whose insight and efforts have been absolutely critical for bringing us all together. Thank you to Christine Dahl, 
for providing a copy of 3,000 Years in Life and permission to screen the film that her late husband, Randall Conrad, made 50 years ago with Stephen Ujlaki. In history and literature, thank you to Lauren Kaminsky, Jessica Shires, Phil Deloria, and the students in my prison abolition seminar. Thank you as well to Tobias Vanderhoop, Flavia Perea, Edward Chung, Satanya Imadejemu, and Lois Ahrens. I would also like to thank my co-organizers, Toussaint Lozier, who is currently on site with the Reverend Rodman, who will be zooming into tonight's panel discussion, and Jamie Bissonette Louis. Jamie had planned to be here with us, but is unable to attend due to a death in the family. She is the author of When the Prisoners Ran Walpole, the book many of you are holding in your hands right now, which she wrote in close collaboration with her co-authors, Ralph Hamm, Bobby DeLello, and Reverend Ed Rodman. This symposium builds on the foundation of that work. Jamie will be greatly missed today and tomorrow. The documentary we're about to watch was filmed in Walpole during the spring 1973 takeover. The NPRA knew that providing accurate information about what was going on inside was essential to their success. The Observer Program, organized by outside supporters in the ad hoc committee, answered this call with a mass mobilization of volunteers. So did filmmakers Randall Conrad and Stephen Ujlaki. This film also offers us half a century later, an invaluable window into that time and place. The film approaches Walpole's prisoners as workers and labor organizers, as family members, community members, as survivors of state terror, and as agents of change capable of powerful, self-determined, transformative acts. So we'll watch the film now, and it's about 40, 45 minutes long, and then we'll move immediately into our panel discussion. So please take a moment to silence your cell phones and um, enjoy 3,000 years and life. Twenty men and women are confined in correctional institutions throughout New England. This one, Walpole, is a maximum security prison in Massachusetts. It has a population of five to six hundred men serving sentences of about two years to life. It would still be typical of the 12 major prisons in New England, except for some events in its recent past. A lockup, which lasted over two and a half months for some men, was answered with a general work strike throughout the institution. This was followed by an unprecedented strike and walkout called by the Correctional Officers Union. The guards, who are normally present in the corridors at all times, preferred to leave their positions unattended rather than see certain prisoners released from their long segregated confinement. The prisoners told us what happened. There was a, a warden here by the name of Raymond Perel, and uh, he was strictly security. And he came in here and he closed the prison down to December the 29th. And when he closed it down, he locked everybody in 24 hours a day, and they went from cell to cell, searched the whole place. We were locked up for 35 days without showers, clean clothing, visits, attorney's visits. Newspaper people couldn't get in here, nobody. During the 35 days, we were yelling and screaming in the cells and swearing at the guards as they were walking by. Guys were being taken out of their cells and they were being bundled by four and five guards and six guards at once. And we all could look out and look at these guys doing this. They really did a hell of a job on some guys. And that just made us stronger and stronger. And we would yell and scream at the guards, spit at them, throw urine at them, throw human waste at them. And when they let us out, uh, guys started burning desks and whatever belonged to the screws, they burnt. All the time, the guys were in the disciplinary blocks, nine and 10 especially, uh, still going without showers all this time. Anyways, when we finally got out, we made a demand that we wanted to get rid of Raymond Perel. They offered all kinds of different things to individuals. We said, no, we can't get along with a madman like him. The God's Union called us into the situation, and they asked us for our cooperation in helping get the prison back to order. The next day, a press release was sent to all the newspapers that the inmates were running the prison. We was called three times. Three times we sat down, three times we tried to help, three times we got stabbed in the back. We got called the fourth time, we didn't go. They were feeding us bologna sandwiches in the cells. All this time we were eating cold food. Breakfast was a bowl of cornflakes, powdered milk, 
and uh, a coffee like that you wouldn't even want to drink. Of course, the screws were making all this stuff. We don't know what they were doing to it, but we know at one time they were urinating in the tea, uh, believe it or not, and they were putting soap powder in certain foods and stuff like that. You could taste it. So we told them, okay, that's it, forget it. Right? We, we're not recognizing parole. We're not cooperating with anybody. We're not working or anything else. When it come down to it, Perel finally resigned. He couldn't take it any longer because we just would not cooperate in any manner, way, or form. Not an inmate would do a lick of work. And without inmates running an institution, working and keeping it clean, then how the hell are they going to run it? Now, when we did finally get out, our second demand was to release the men that were locked in nine and ten blocks who had gone 78 days without showers, without ever coming out of their cells, without clean clothing of any type. All the guards got together and they told the acting warden at that time, uh, I forget his name, they had so many of them since then, they had about eight of them here, that if he released the men from nine and 10, that they would walk off the job. Before he even made a decision, the guards got together and walked off the job, which left nobody here. They're the ones that say they're in fear of their lives because they've done something to somebody. Right. They right. should expect a reprisal. Just put something in some food, you have to beat them half to death, and you expect them to, when you come back in, to shake your hand or pat you on the back? I sure. I'd be scared, too, if I beat the hell out of someone in here, and there's 500 of them in here. I wouldn't come back either. So we told them to get some outside observers in here as neutral coordinators, just to observe both sides, that that just might work and hold the place together, rather than people dying, because it was right down to a dying situation. If the state troopers come in, somebody would have died. A lot of us would have died. I don't know if they would have died, but we certainly would have given it a good fight. When we visited Walpole, the prisoners had ended their work strike. The guards were still out, and we found an entire society at work. A very complex society that puts out official state documents, records in printed forms, building materials, light handicraft, license plates for the registry of motor vehicles, and 1,800 meals a day for its population. And so it has its workers, its employers, its organizations, its cooks, craftsmen, educators, even its artists, its administration, and its police. But this administration doesn't pay its workers any minimum wage. It doesn't offer them adequate job safety or health care or adequate education and job training. Twice a day, it locks them behind bars for a population count. It locks them up every night. And it has the power to lock them up indefinitely. But as a result of the last lockup and the unprecedented walkout by the guards, an organization of prisoners, the NPRA, or National Prisoners Reform Association, had emerged in a position of leadership among the men. We talked with NPRA members inside Walpole. Before Raymond Perel came here, this was one of the most racist prisons in the country. This prison was terrible. You know, everybody was mad to Raymond Perel because he abused our manhood, he abused with our families, he abused with everything. He did us a favor. He said, well, you know, you're all dirt, and we're going to treat you like dirt. He said, well, if we're all dirt, we're going to be dirt together. And that's just what we did. He, he created a unity, Raymond Perel did. But a unity isn't nothing unless you've got self-discipline and education. So that's what NPRA did. They undertook the task of uh, educating the cons and teaching them what self-discipline was all about. Now, we educated the cons as to uh, not ripping off their brothers, not ripping them off for their personal property, because we are ripped off by the system. We're rip, ripped off for our, our families, our loved ones, our kids, our wives, our daughters. And now, if a con rips off another con for his personal belongings, he becomes what the system is. He becomes a pig, see? And so, we educate the cons as to not becoming pigs, to stay together in a unity. So we've got the unity plus the education and the self-discipline. Not only that, uh, in any prison you'll find rapes, we stopped at Walpole. We don't have no more rapes. Very seldom does a man get ripped off his personal property. Now, how we educate these men, we don't educate them but through brute force as a disciplinary squad would do. As a goon squad would go in and break somebody's head because he's stealing from someone or because he's raped someone or he's done something wrong, we will approach the person and we will educate him. We will embarrass him, so to speak, in front of his peers, all the men in the block, We'll call him in front of all the men in the block and ask him why he did it. 
and educate him as to the fact that he's becoming a pig if he continues to act like that. The majority of the men that we've talked to like that put their head down would be greatly ashamed and would thank us and say they were sorry. You pat him on the back, give him a cigarette, and say, that's all right, it's no big thing. Just be our brother, as we're your brother. At the present time, we have, we have been recognized by the Department of Correction, just as the MPRA sole bargaining power of the inmates in the, in the population. What we're working for now is certification as a union here in Massachusetts. Hopefully, we'll branch to Norfolk, Concord, Framingham, all the county jails, uh, and across the nation. Uh, and when I say certification as a union, <clears throat> we want minimum wages. We want outside industries to come in here. Either that, you know, give us you know, the same kind of pay you would pay someone else to make them license plates. We want safety standards. A man can go into a shop, and many have done it, work one of the machines and take half his arm off. I've seen men with the whole hand gone. Young, young guys ain't not, not even supposed to be running a machine. 17 years old, his hand was gone. That's, we want that. We want, like the gods, they're not responsible. They can do anything they want in this institution and get away with it. If we become a union like they're a union, we can take them to court for that. We're, we're being undermined constantly by the administration. Both sides. On, on both sides, right. The administration and the Department of Correction. They use certain tools against us. The Department of Correction has the furlough, which they use as a tool. Right now, no one's getting furloughs. So that's to bend the men. Later on, they'll start implementing furloughs, and the, the ones that they give them to will be probably the leaders, guys like us. And then they'll try to bend us to their will. We'll give you a furlough. Now you do this for us. You do that for us. That's already been tried with me. How are we going to fight that? How are we going to fight it? It's the same way we fought in segregation. They had me in phase one, and a lot of the guys in phase one, they asked us if we wanted to move to phase two. If we were good, we could move to phase two. We told them to stick phase two. We'd stay in phase one. That's how you fight it. Now, they offer me the furlough. They say, you have to do, do this in order to get a furlough. I'll tell them we'll stick to furlough. We watched the men in block four take their own count. Their elected representative orders the doors closed. They are controlled electronically by a guard stationed in this booth opposite the three tiers of cells. Some cells are being held open for latecomers. Today, the representative is working in the company of a cadet guard and some civilian observers. Gentlemen, my name is Walter Tyler. I represent Block 4, and I'm dead serious about my whole issue. Because we were accused, we were accused, not convicted, accused, not convicted, accused of a charge. And they, therefore, a system we function under put us here. We want to change the system. And we are proven to society that we are capable and qualified to govern ourselves to the state of the word. This jail, from now on out, this jail like it, Walpole, before, jammed up, killing and so forth and so on, forget it. You understand me? And I can assure you, brothers, all you brothers, mouth side and whatnot, right? We are representing Walpole. We say we can govern ourselves and we have been doing that. No matter who come in here, they cannot take advantage of an inmate govern an inmate. Ten is out. These guys work in the kitchen. The cadets are young trainees without uniforms. They are the only guards now that the old officers have walked out. In the old system, the guard took the count. He could mark a man absent if he was not standing in sight at his door for the full half hour. Now, the reason why we take this method, right, for correction officers not concerned, right, is because every man is not in his room at count time. When the doors are closed, it's because the man is consigned to a different area or the institution. You know, when the officers was here, there was a lot of forcing going on. If a guy didn't work, he gets locked up. He gets locked up in his room. 
So now we're faced with uh, the problem of uh, trying to get help without that force. A lot of guys volunteer, and we have about 32 men that are regular kitchen workers. That is, every morning you don't have to go look for them. They're right here, and you can depend on them. I would say that things are going better. I might have to work long hours. I might have to go on the cook line and help out. I might have to come back here and screw up this floor. But it is my job to see that it get done. So why tell a man to do something that I wouldn't do myself? See, I'm not that type. If I ask someone to do something, I get right in there with them. And that's what's the problem with uh, the, the outside cooks. All they was doing just pointing fingers, say, do this, do that. They didn't have to cook. They didn't have to touch a pot over there. Right? We were cooking that. Right? They didn't have to serve the line. Right? They didn't have to scrub a floor. They didn't have to do nothing but open and close those boxes and go over there and uh, give water, say, you scrub over here or you serve over the line over here. That's all they had to do. It was a waste of money, really. They didn't waste no time because they ate it the whole while they was here. And they uh, sit down and drink a whole lot of steak coffee, so it wasn't no time wasted. But it was a whole lot of money wasted. That's the main thing that was wasted. Number one, they were corrections officer cook or corrections officer chef. Number one, they were corrections officers. So their job here was custodial primarily because right in their civil service exam that they must know how to handle firearms and so forth. And uh, they were just here like overseers to make sure that the inmates who were doing the work here weren't uh, stealing. I've been following a, a news program recently, this, this, these different uh, fraud cases and, and, and stuff like Watergate and whatnot. Now we have a situation here with these corrections officers, cooks, there's seven of them. I, I understand one of them quit, so maybe there's only six. But these guys are coming in here every morning and they're punching in outside and they're guy room. They're punching in. And they're being paid that 190 or that 210 or 230 or whatever the case may be. They're being paid every day for being here. Now before they were being paid, they had to come in here and do nothing. Now they're not even coming inside and doing anything. They're doing nothing out there. They're playing ping pong or they're leaving. They're punching in and leaving the premises, going back home. And they're being paid every day. Now this is fraud. There's a scandal there. You know, if you're paying that one guy $210 a week, let's say, why can't you take your, your, the people you have in responsible, your inmate workers in here, and make them resident employees of the state and pay three of them $70 a week? We asked the first cook in what ways his job was differently defined now that the officers were gone. I am accountable to the inmate population for exactly uh, where their food is going, see. No one handles those keys with the exception of myself, the kitchen manager, and the kitchen supervisor, who's also our first baker here. Uh, it used to be uh, like, to be quite frank and honest with you, uh, it was a hustle in the kitchen. Every guy that worked in the kitchen could make a little hustle for himself if he didn't have any money, see. Just like any other of the shops here, whether it be the laundry or whatever the case may be, the print shop, the guy could have had a chance he could make himself a little hustle in here. And I could do quite well as first cook and uh, Mr. Nixon here working with me. We could make quite a little hustle if we wanted to. But now uh, that I've got keys, now that I am responsible, I'm lucky, you know, <laughs> I can't put my hands on anything. I can't do nothing no more because I, I, owe a you know, I have a responsibility to the population because uh, I'm looking out for their food so that I can give them more than they were having before. We will, and uh, we want to get paid as a, uh, you know, as a minimum wage, you know, a dollar sixty an hour. I don't know. I'm working, and uh, I don't know if I'm getting paid or not. As far as I know, we're getting thirty-five cents a day. All my family is most of them. They're in Puerto Rico, and uh, if I can, you know, have a minimum wage in here, you know, I can send some to my family. This, this, this trains them for nothing. It, it qualifies them for employment in any state prison in the country because it's the only place they make number plates is in state prisons. You see, so and then they kick them out cold on the street after three or four years of making number plates, and uh, then they're supposed to be rehabilitated. 
why don't we deserve the minimum wage if we're doing the work that they'd have to pay on the street? If a guy is making a dollar a day or something like that, right? When he goes out, them prices are sky high out there. So he's going out with $100 or something. The only thing he can buy is a gun. That's all he can buy. And then he's right back where he started. You see, these are the programs we want to get away from. We want to set up more programs like this printing apprentice program. Put men out there, give them a half a shot. Uh, you know, uh, with a, a saleable skill. We have a printing apprenticeship program here. Now, under this program, we're under contract of indenture, which is a regular contract. As you know, an apprenticeship thing is a step thing on the street. Every six months, a man gets a pay raise. This is what happens here. So the, the time that the men serve in here, that means the longer time they have in, the, the higher pay scale they're going to go to on the outside. So there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know what I mean? Across the hall from the state-financed schoolroom is the new adult basic education program, which the prisoners have set up independently. You know, we can remodel this whole school because what you see across the hall is nothing. We don't have enough textbooks here. No, we don't even have no decent desks in here. That's all the desks you see over there. And you got 600 guys in this institution who wants to come to school, and what they gonna sit in, 55 chairs? So I set the room up by myself. Uh, I put the cabinet, I fixed the books up. I put draperies up in here. There's no sense for the Department of Correction paying a teacher $8,000 to come into Walpool to teach. And here I am, qualified, got a college degree, have teaching experience. Here's a man just got out of college, no teaching experience. You can take that $8,000 and we can use it here at Walpool. So this teacher comes in here from 8 to 4, he picks up his check, boom, he's gone. We're here 24 hours. We know what the guys in here need. They're going to come in and tell us what they're going to teach us. And well, how you teach a brother from the ghetto some 50-syllable word? I know how to relate to the guys. The guys are coming down. There's no shucking and jiving. Because, see, I'm for real with the guy. How many hours do you work a day? I told about 14 hours a day, 14 or 15 hours a day. How much you get paid? 35 cents a seven-day week period, which is not right. Because uh, five dollars and five dollars go, five dollars and eighty cent go in my savings, and four dollars go in my personal spend. So that that's supposed to be my money and everything. Cause see, like this, I'm doing a natural life sentence, so this is permanent home to me. And I want to try to set up a good curriculum here at the school and everything. Observers are admitted to Walpole. They are volunteers. Their job is to observe the activity in the prison and to report any abusive situations. They are admitted in continuous regular shifts at 7 a.m., 3 p.m., and at all-night shift at 11 p.m. Women observers are not admitted in the prison itself. This observer will remain in the visitor's waiting room as a coordinator for this shift. The men, at least, wearing identifying armbands are free to eat with the prisoners and to talk with them in all areas of the prison. The guards, on the other hand, are confining their presence to security control points, such as the visitor's waiting room. In the main corridor, they stand behind the shatterproof windows through which the men must signify their intention to pass through to the visiting areas. In this situation, the NPRA has taken on many responsibilities, including the admission procedure for new prisoners. Well, any other problems or anything else that you need now? I am the representative for down here, as far as a phone call, I want to call you and inform your people or anything else, wait a while, or anything else, we can do this. We haven't been granted the right to have you make the phone call yet. It's being negotiated, but uh, we don't have an administration to negotiate with. Can you ask me, and uh, if you have any problems upstairs, you'll let the NPRA know if there's any problems bothering you. Prisoners no longer have to see their family in the confines of a waiting room under the scrutiny of guards. The playground equipment was not furnished by the state, but by the NPRA. You're 
exhibit? Where? Well, this this one in particular, and and others that I have are going to be exhibited uh, May 4th at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts. Have you ever exhibited before? A couple of times at, at Harvard, a few times at the State House, and uh, a few at a few other uh, private. Uh, exhibitions by different people. Did you ever win any prizes or anything? Any recognition? I won three first prizes at Harvard. I was accepted to go to the uh, New Orleans School of Art. I took a test while I was in here. How long have you been in, Peter? Too long. Too long? 18 years. 18 years? When do you see the pro boy? When can you hit the street? I don't see the pro board and I don't hit the street. Here forever. We have about the 20,000 list eventually. At least 20,000. Let's get about 10 guys that will contribute with typewriters. This tiny cell in block A3 has become the headquarters of a public education campaign. There's 130 lifers in this institution. And throughout the state, there's about 300 lifers, which is a very large amount. And the reason why it's so large is because they have to stay in prison for 15 or 20 years, in some cases longer, uh, without having a chance to get out on parole. And this is particularly uh, pertinent to the younger offender. Why say that man must serve 15 years before you decide on whether or not to let him out? It should be done much, much sooner than that. And a long pull, in my opinion, after 25 years of servitude in prisons, I'm convinced that it would reduce crime. Statistics prove this, of course. And, and what we're trying to do is educate the public, and we're trying to say that if you will lower the uh, time spent in prison for a lifer, or at least lower the mandatory requirement, that's what we're asking. And we say that other states are doing this successfully. That is the reason for these letters. I've sent out about 3,500, and I expect to send out about 4,500 more within the next, say, 10 days, 15 days. The inmate artist submitted this picture here. Prisoners rights, prison reform, support, NPRA. The colors are gonna be red and green. I spoke to the guys in the print shop. I figured we'd get like a thousand copies done. The thing is heavy enough. I approve of it, you know. The directors of the NPRA at Walpole are meeting to review the existing situation and to anticipate future developments. I'd like to add some myself for the officers and inmates in Walpole. The guards walked out and said, to hell with everybody, right? They left us to kill each other. Well, well, they, well they, they, the biggest criteria at that time, we all know, was security. At night, we, uh, Responsible to them are the members of over 20 committees. The men who manage the kitchen, the hospital, the distribution of mail, educational programs, industrial production, and all block representatives are charged with solving internal problems. If a more general problem comes up, the board discusses it. The board's policy is then brought in turn before the prison population for discussion and approval. In case any member of the board is suddenly transferred to a segregation unit or to another prison, he is immediately replaced by a committee member. By 11 o'clock anyway. But he could, since they left, there's been no stabbings, no nothing. Security come almost on the basis of respect. Okay. Now they're trying to figure out, well, they say we went out on the strike, you know, they thought inmate mentality was foolish. They said, now we got to get our power back. See? Right. They want their jobs back. They want to be able to take the count. You know, they want to be able to run the kitchen, and the foundry, and all these things that we're doing more efficiently than they are and yeah. for a lot less money. And they know once we can make the public know that a prison could be run by us, that we can govern ourselves, meaning that there's no one outside to get hurt, like a guard or something like that, and that it costs, man, about two-thirds less. And plus, bring up our standard of living, making it easier to rehabilitate, you know, they would lose their jobs. They're leaving right. doors open again. They left the minimum and the maximum doors to the yard open last night till 9.30. You see, now they, they're just waiting for somebody to make a move in the yard to violate the security so they can send the state police in here, right? So it's up to us to advise and educate all our brothers out there so no one can fall into this trap right. and destroy everything that we've got working for us here, you know? We've got to keep always, like, we have two steps ahead of them. Yeah. It's not just the uh, 
the cons that are being harassed right now and undermined, it's also the cadet screws that are coming in here, the new screws and the observers. Now, the, the guards are slicing their tires out in the parking lot and cutting their water hoses and, you know, just harassing That's a crime, isn't it? They're committing crimes against them, right, right. That's what they're doing to the cadets and the observers that are coming in here. See, to, to undermine it, to undermine the whole movement, to get the cadets to quit and walk out and the observers to quit and walk out so they can come back in and initiate their reign of terror again so they can go stalking the corridors with their blackjacks and pulling guys out of the cells after after a 10, 10 o'clock count. The goon squad, right? They all take a detour and go down to 10 yeah. block. Yeah, right. Now you talk about control, what about those guys up there? They get beat up every night, you know what I mean? Now it was in the paper and the cadets observed this. And our observers observed that the marshals taking the guy, I forget his name, you know his name, but you was there, right? Whitey yeah. Hurst, right? They beat him up in front of the cadets. Lock one of the, lock Charlie Kraft or somebody up in a cell until they took care of to what they call their they business. If it wasn't for them observers, they would have never hit the papers. In fact, them police there have been suspended. I personally believe it isn't only the screws here in Massachusetts. I think it's all over New England and maybe from across the country a colonist or a Doyle, the president of the Guards Union, and telling him to tell the guards to play games with us as often as they can so they can break us. Right now we have the unity. That's the only thing that come, come out good during the December 29th lockup was Peral united us. We never was disunited in all the years that this president w was here, 17 years. And now the whole country, all the other prisoners are watching us and they want to know what our final outcome is going to be here at Walpole. Are the screws going to be able to walk the corridors or they're just going to stay in the control? Are we going to have a say of what kind of programs come in here, educational, vocational, and what have you? At the same time that the NPRA took responsibility for all functions inside Walpole, prisoners' rights groups from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, Connecticut, and Maine assembled outside the state capitol in Concord, New Hampshire. Over 30 groups have now united as a coalition, the New England Prisoners Association. One of these groups is the NPRA, which has outside chapters as well as inside unions at Walpole and at Cranston, Rhode Island. As their first public action, they were marching in support of 260 men undergoing a lockup at New Hampshire State Prison in Concord. The prison officials had begun the lockup at about the same time the Walpole guards had walked out and the NPRA had become a strong force. The lockup was now in its seventh week. One of the prisoners we had met in Walpole had been in the Concord prison during this lockup. I was transferred from here up to the state prison to uh, stand trial in Concord, New Hampshire. During this time, uh, we sort of hit the tail end of this lockup that they had, and it was a, a carbon copy of the one that we had here under Perel. I guess they went under the same pretense as uh, Perel did. They said it was a contraband search. But what they actually did was strip the men of all their personal belongings. While you were there, was during the lockup, was there any observers there, any outside community groups getting in the institution? No, no, just uh, personal visits, uh, family only. Was there a lot of damage then during the riot they had up in Concord, New Hampshire? That's what we read in the paper here. Well, there wasn't any riot up there while I was there. Uh, the fellows were screaming a lot at night and uh, they wanted to get out of their cells and it came out in the paper that there was a riot up there the following day. But uh, there was no riot. No riot at all. Why do you think the papers call it a riot? I think to uh, snow the public, to uh, keep the public thinking that uh, there was a lot of trouble in this place and uh, that uh, they had to uh, keep these men locked in. But uh, there was no riot up there, and they don't have to keep these men locked in. Can men in Concord get organized like the NPRA did in Walpole? There's a lot of smart fellows up there and, uh, uh, that could lead the rest, uh, but I think they have to have some outside help. We had down here the Ad Hoc Committee, uh, the Car Cap Committee, and quite a number of others that were fighting for us on the outside. That, at one time, we didn't even know about And uh, when we did find out about it, it unified the men inside. And uh, I think the same thing could be done up there. And I think it's needed. Less than three weeks after the New Hampshire lockup ended, newspapers reported that a riot at Walpole had forced the administration to call in the state police. One Boston newspaper reconstructed the order of events in the following phrases, May 20th, 1973. 
the inmates broke through hollow cinder block walls. Acting Superintendent Wakevich said the inmates rushed into the hospital section and overpowered correction officers, driving out the chief physician and the chief medic. Three inmates were wounded with shotgun pellets fired by correction officers trying to clear the corridors to enable firefighters to enter. At 6.45 a.m., armed with shotguns, tear gas guns, tear gas grenades, gas masks, clubs, and riot helmets, the 180 troopers moved inside, followed by 45 correction officers with clubs and riot helmets and police dogs. When we came back to Walpole, we could still see the large holes that had been made in the walls on either side of the central grills that separate the two areas of cell blocks. Some of the holes were still waiting for repair, but most of them had already been patched with plywood. The newspaper reports had not specified at what time the grills had been closed. They had been kept open during the guard's strike. They were open again now that the lockup had ended. We also found that cell block 9, the former death row which had been closed at the demand of the NPRA, had once again been used to contain prisoners. We found the guards back at their jobs, in the corridors and also in the segregation blocks. At the time of the shakedown, the civilian observers had been excluded. Now they were inside once more on a regular basis. What the newspaper called a spontaneous but inevitable riot had resulted from a disagreement between the prisoners and the acting superintendent over the procedure for implementing a 48-hour shakedown. We had the, all the news media here, we had a press conference, and we asked for the 48-hour shakedown, invited uh, District Attorney Burke and the crew to come in. You know, so there was no hassles about the shakedown. The confusion was in the way he wrote the memo out. This memorandum was not recognizing the NPRA, and uh, they were going to do numerous and other things uh, on visits, pertaining to visits, pertaining to visiting in the yard, and all nonsense. And we had a peaceful demonstration that we refused to lock in the cells until we seen somebody with authority. And what happened is there's two grills out here separating maximum and minimum. And these two grills were opened all night until the 11 o'clock shift come on. And about at 12 o'clock at night, they closed these two doors so that guys were trapped. Rumors were running around that uh, massive destruction was occurring in the prison. And uh, various representatives went around the institution and found out that this wasn't so. At one time, we were called and told that uh, blocks four and block eight had ripped off all the panels and the guys in block six we're using grappling hooks to try to climb up into the galleries. We went down to the maximum section and found, you know, most of the guys had already gone to bed. Now, this is about three or four times that this occurred, these rumors. And not once during the night did Wakevich come in. Now, this man's the warden of the prison. He just picked a block out at random or something and informed the guy that picked up the telephone that the state cops were coming in. You know, I says, uh, what the hell are you talking about? He says, that's it. He says, you've had all the time you're going to have. We're coming in. So they're getting panicky because you got the state troopers coming in and they're caught in between the gates. And the other inmates are concerned about their friends. They don't want to abandon them to the mercy of the state police. And then he changed up on us and he says, you know, everybody got to go back to his own individual room. And that started the panic off. He was saying since uh, 12 or 1 o'clock that the state cops were coming in. They didn't actually come in until early in the morning. You know, but everyone was of the opinion that they were already on their way through the door coming in. You know, and then guys put the hole through the walls to get back to their own sections. Then afterwards, uh, it was about 2 o'clock, Peter called me from the Mac, from minimum section to get some guys down there to cover the hospital and, you know, keep things cool on that end. There was a couple of screws behind control with shotguns and some other kind of weapons. There was no fire engines here or state police here at that time. And they just started firing right through the glass at them. There was big holes in the glass. And, uh... They, they also said that they fired one warning shot up in the year, but there's no marks or anything up in the year. They also said they were firing rubber bullets when everybody was hit with uh, uh, pellets. So they were all stuck in their legs, covered. Plastic yeah, pellets. Yeah, but they, was, they were hitting... Bird shot. They had metal ones. Metal. Yeah. Metal. Yeah. Metal yeah. Metal Anyways, when they went down, we went into the hospital and grabbed a stretcher, sent two guys down there to pick them up. And... Uh, as soon as the guys went down with the stretcher, he was picking them up, one of them fired again, and he got hit all on the side. And he went down. So we sent out some more guys to pick out those guys. And finally, they stopped shooting. They let us pick them up and bring them to the hospital. So when we got them to the hospital, we just locked the doors and went into the hospital. And uh, the doctor was there by then. And uh, we just let 
Nobody at all go into the hospital area other than corns that were hurt or if a screw was hurt. Other than that, we wouldn't let the state police in or other screws in. And we just let people in that were hurt. Well, I was in the, in the hospital at the time. I was a patient in the hospital. I was an inmate that was inside the hospital that I remember. The troopers was trying to bust into the door, and they told them that they had heart patients in there, and they said they didn't care they was coming in. And they said, well, we're going to stand right here. We're not going to let you in because there's a lot of sick men in here. But uh, if it hadn't been for those four inmates that was there at that time, I think they would have busted those doors open and uh, just wreaked, wreaked, wreaked havoc on the inmates that were sick in the hospital there. Like Wakevich, it was well, funny in a sense. Come over the PA system and, you know, and he repeated this about three or four times. No one was going to be hurt. So now on block six, they came in and some of the doors that couldn't close, wouldn't shut. State cops come in and buff the guys up, dragged them out of their rooms, threw their radios and TVs right off the tier, third tier and whatnot. There must have been about 60 of them. And they come in and they just crucified us. Stripped us naked, tied our hands around behind our backs and sapped up guys, tore us down flights of stairs. We had to go down a gauntlet of screws uh, of the state cops. Uh, Representative Owens had to see this. Uh, what was that, Walter Anderson? Yeah. When I was in the hospital, he admitted seeing me getting tossed down a flight of stairs. Then he made us walk barefoot the whole length of the corridor to block 10, which was all glass all over the floor. So everybody had glass stuck in their feet and whatnot. Keep remembering Wakevich, you know, no one's going to get hurt. These interviews were recorded in June. Shortly afterwards, the administration of the prison changed hands. The acting superintendent was replaced by the head of the uniformed branch of the state police. The state commissioner of corrections was also forced to resign. The civilian observer program was again suspended. It has not been resumed. Inside Walpole, the prisoners voted by a majority of 94% to keep the NPRA as their representative body instead of creating an inmate council. The lieutenant governor of the state announced that he had allocated half a million dollars for repairs leading to security at Walpole. A work strike by the prisoners was answered by another lockup. The men were to be let out only for meals. They began a hunger strike. The newspapers reported that the exact nature of the prisoners' grievances was not known. So uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Keith Harvey. I'm the Regional Director for the American Friends Service Committee. I'm going to be facilitating tonight. Um, um, to my, all the way to my right is Albert Brown. He served almost 40 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. He was recently released and exonerated and was in Walpole during these turbulent years. At that time, he was a member of the National Prison Reform Association and board member of the Black African Nation Toward Unity, Bantu. Um, next to me is a good friend, Bobby DeLillo. Um, he was the first president of the National Prison Reform Association, NPRA, um, serving alongside Vice President Ralph Hamm. Uh, raised in Boston, he survived incarceration as a child in the notorious Lamon School for Boys Bobby was, renowned, was a renowned leader within Massachusetts state prison system during his 40 years of incarceration. He escaped six times. Oh. <laughs> you heard <laughs> Well, you heard him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I, I, okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Bobby, uh, in 2003, um, his conviction was overturned, and his life without parole, without parole sentence was vacated. 
He has continued to organize and fight for those behind the walls since coming home. Um, and finally, above me here is uh, Reverend Ed uh, Rodman. Uh, uh, he is retired Episcopal priest. He's a former professor of pastor, uh, pastoral theology, a consultant to the Urban Bishops Coalition, co-founder of the Urban Caucus, and consultant to the Union of Black Episcopalians. He's an honorary doctor of pastoral theology at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge, an honorary doctor of law at St. Augustine University, Raleigh, North Carolina. He was a leader of the ad hoc committee, an outside organization supporting the NPRA at Walpole. And so, um, Ed, I'm gonna allow you to do, um, if I missed anything, to, to do a brief and any opening remarks that you may have. Um, okay, B Bobby, if you can introduce yourself and do a brief intro um, real quick. Yeah. Yeah, I'll come back to Ed. I'm Bobby Villello, uh, notorious troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard thing to explain to citizens conditions of a prison. Corrections is not about corrections. Corrections is about job security. When them guards went out on strike, the purpose was to have a bloodbath to get rid of Boone. It's hard to explain it to you because it brings back <laughs> real serious feelings. I mean, that was a visitation that like, you had to be there to understand it, to see what was going on. The institution, we had in a 18 month period, 20 murders in Walpole. And why we had the murders was because the Department of Corrections was using drugs to control the population. You know what Adderall is? It's speed. Prisoners were on 80 milligrams of Adderall a day. After a couple of weeks of that, they were stabbing each other over nonsense. They never, when you read the book, you'll see we mentioned it in the book. They never challenged that, never refuted it. The deputy would call the hospital and tell the medics, uh, give Delalo Tarwin two or three days. I'm getting paid for being a stove pigeon with drugs. And that was a problem in the prison. We had it in control. They had the opportunity of opportunities to really take care of corrections in the state of Massachusetts, and they just blew it. They let it go up by the wayside. Uh, I'm not sure how far we're going to go with this, but uh, seeing that was like, wow. Wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody recognized me in there. I was the guy with all the hair. Yeah. <laughs> we recognized you, Bobby. <laughs> so, um, Albert, do you want to do a quick one and some opening remarks? Yes, as you already know, I'm Albert Brown. Unfortunately, I happened to be there during those times. And I got to tell you now, I'm 71 years old, most dangerous times that I ever experienced and places that I ever been was in Walpole. That's how Walpole was a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous place. Um, of course, you expected to go do your time and be taken care of and you didn't expect to be beat up and raped up and um, all the lousy things that happened to some people in prison. Um, I happened to be one of the youngest prisoners at the time. Not only young, I was short in stature. I was small. I'll never forget. When I first got there, they told me, they said, listen, you got to go get two knives. And I said, why? They said, because some people are going to come at you. And you take one knife, you carry them on you at all times. You, the person that comes to assault you, to rape you, you stab them with this knife, 
and you drop the other knife near his body, and you won't get first degree. You'll get self-defense or something. There's no self-defense. But that was, that was the first lesson that I was told getting there. And I'm like, and, and, and I got there um, at the St. Patty's Day uh, a situation. Um, I'm, I'm a city kid. You know, uh, up until then, I was a petty criminal. Petty, cr you know, stealing this, stealing that. Um, <clears throat> then one day, one night, we're all doing our time. And one guy decides he wants to burn another guy alive. And that's what he did. He took, he took the, the lacquer, because he had an avocation to glue things together. He took this lacquer, poured it in a cup, reached out of his cell, over to the next cell and poured it into the guy's cell and told him, yeah, you SOB, I got you now. Now, all the inmates in the block, they're all locked up, are yelling for the guards to come help because they know this guy's going to light the match. And he did. It was an inferno. It was so hot in the, in, the, in the cell that the marble toilet crumbled and the sink crumbled. So, you know, there was no body left. So now I'm a young kid from the city, and I'm watching all this. I'm smelling it, and I can't believe it. I'm like, where am I? And I couldn't call nobody and say, listen, call somebody and tell them to get me out of here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is what prison is about. And so that was my introduction into Walpole. So I knew things were real serious, and I knew things could happen real fast. So I had to be observant. You know, I had to watch and listen, watch him and Ralph. They were, I, I, they were heroes for a lot of us. Because one thing Bobby and Ralph did was they kept us safe. They did the best they could to keep us safe. Safe from who? Myself, administration, and there was some dramatic stuff that happened. And other elements. No, no, no. no. Oops. I'm going to let Ed talk. Um, Ed, if you could. Give us some imp, uh, opening remarks. And just um, make sure you speak up. Um, uh, can you hear me, Ed? Yeah, I can hear you now. OK, great. Um, just uh, have an opportunity to give some opening remarks um, 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 before I start asking questions. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, the only thing that I would say is that it was all about the prisoners and their rights. We were there to support them. And to the extent that we were able to, that is what we did. There was never any controversy between us and the prisoners. And I would say in general, that the amount of discipline that they showed <laughs> was remarkable. And it is too bad that <laughs> that hasn't come across until we're talking about it now because they ran the prison they had the knowledge and the insight and they had believe it or not compassion for each other and there was very little if any turmoil until the very end bobby um and and albert i'm going to throw this question at you um because uh we don't have ralph here can you talk a little bit about Ralph and, and how you first Ralph started Wilson. working working with Ralph? Well, they closed a section of Bridgewater State Hospital and the alcoholic section and whatnot, and they had like 300 guards. So what they did is they took us prisoners out of the segregation units in Walpole and brought us down to Bridgewater, all right? Which was essentially a mental hospital. No, no, it was a nut house. I heard a lot of noise. There's a little window on a door. I, and looking out, there was about 20 guards coming. And the black guy was in the middle. And there was about another 20 behind them. And he was bleeding down here. And he was walking proud. <laughs> I mean, he had his chest out like he had no fear. And I was watching him walk by. 
And I said, wow, you know, this kid got balls, right? I mean, you knew he was a young guy. They put him and me out in the little yard together, and for some reason, they thought I would beat him up. And they were looking out from the windows, and I told Ralph, I said, you see them guards up there? He said, they're anticipating me beating you up. I don't beat prisoners up for screws. And we had a good conversation. And I explained to him the reality of the prison system and what happened and like looking up at the window watching these guards. Like, you know, corrections is not about corrections. Corrections is about job security. And that's the crux of the problem. And you got to understand that in order to see what's going on. When you look at Walpole, you're looking at insanity, and if you look with a rational mind, you're going to miss it. It's hard to explain it, but like Ralph, he grew up in Walpole. He, he had a, a machete. <laughs> it had been about this high, probably about that wide, and they handled I have to use two hands to hold it, right? And the state cops came in, and they opened his door, and he jumped up, and here's this big black guy, big afro, with all kinds of African symbols on him, and the state cop slammed the door shut, and he says, and we'll be right back. He never came back. <laughs> he saw this big black guy, and they peed their pants. <laughs> But this was Ralph. Ralph was a good guy. I really got to like him a lot. And his crime was a little heavy. But he did a lot of good work in the prison system. He helped a lot of people out. And he's still under their supervision. Yeah. Yes. The thing is, he's out on the street now with a bracelet around his ankle. Why? Everybody doesn't have a bracelet. He can't talk to me. If he talks to me, they'll violate him. If he talks to Shorty Mac, they'll violate him. So, uh, Albert, and, uh, your thoughts on Ralph, real quick. Well, Ralph, like I said, Ralph was one of my heroes in during those, during those times. Ralph, he was six foot six, about two, what, 250? He was this huge presence, this huge afro, dashiki, like Bobby said, a sword. Now let me explain the sword. At one time in Walpole, everybody had to be armed. Oh yeah. You got beat up if you didn't have your knife. And if, if you and I were partners or friends, when you took a shower, you went in the shower with your knife. I stood outside the shower with my knife and stood guard. Guys were getting killed. No, guys were getting butchered. Because guys were getting stabbed 95 times. The first time killed them, so the other 94 was what? Some psychopath stuff? And getting their neck cut off and their testicles ripped off their body. What kind of madness is this? So I didn't know where I was. I said, am I in the nut house? Or... or, or this is yes, state prison. <laughs> and, um, and so Ralph sort of kind of put it all in perspective um, for the youngsters, because I was one of the youngsters. And I was one of the youngsters that could be reached. They know they could reach me to reach the youngsters, you know, my peers. And because we needed the young people to get on board, we needed all prisoners, uh, Bobby and him, to be together on the same page about whatever it was. And I, I told a little simple story the other day uh, about one time um, visiting room, the visit room yard was nice. You know, uh, you could sit on the grass with your family or sit on the benches. Well, we wanted to put some swings in a merry-go-round and they put up for our kids. So the kids wanted to just keep running around. So Bobby and them pitched it to the administration, went around, made a um, collection from all of us. We gave them all the money. They sent the money to the company. The company sent the stuff here, and the administration wouldn't let it in. Well, we shut the joint down. 
He said, what? We, we, we said, okay, don't nobody go nowhere. And I think that's the one where they had a mediator. They flew a mediator in from Texas, Texas yeah. to come in to mediate with us over a little issue like that, swings in a merry-go-round for our kids. You know, that was nonsense. Um, but but uh, the band, well, I'll wait till you pose the question. I'll no, no, question. no, I, I just remember you were saying that Bobby and Ralph, right. folks. They were it. You know, the, the, everything was cool, and, the, you know, it, the Ab violence stopped. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, um, uh, uh, people were, were orientated. People were educated, motivated, uplifted. Um, Nobody escaped. Um, <laughs> except for him. <laughs> and, and, and no, no, uh, um, I just want to have um, Ed and as part of the ad hoc committee during those times, what was it, what motivated you all to volunteer and come in? And was there any training and thing? Can you talk a little bit about that and how that went? Yeah, the main thing that was uh, motivating us was a desire to support the prisoners and to be visible so that hopefully everybody would be on their good behavior. Mm -hmm. And that was the case for the majority of the time that we were in there. It was amazing to me that the discipline that they showed was uh, contagious. We also uh, amped up the educational programs that were, had been available, but only on a limited and rationed basis. And that I think was one of the most important things that we did in terms of getting GEDs and people getting other degrees and fundamentally empowering the prisoners to, to truly be self-determined. That was, I think, our major contribution was supporting them in doing the things that they had wanted to do, but had been denied. So it had been and has been an interesting experience, even as I reflect 50 years later to know that we were able to accomplish what we did in a very short period of time, because the whole effort only lasted about two and a half, three months, and then they kind of shut it down. So it was an interesting experiment. It is one that shows that prisoners are capable of self-determination, but that is something that is not permitted anymore. Bobby, you wanted to? Yeah, an uh, example of the insanity of the state prison. Guards like to say that they're professionals and they know how to run the place and this and that. Imagine this, <laughs> you got a cell block, 45 people in one end and 72 at the other end and they're putting drug addicts in cell blocks with drug dealers, and then they're wondering why they have a drug problem in the prison system. <laughs> they had built these classic plexiglass, little booths where you're visiting, and they ran it for a little while, then they had to get it out of there. Why? is prisoners were overdosing on drugs that couldn't possibly have come from the visit. There was no contact with your visit. And this is the insane parts of the insane. I mean, there's so much more. I don't want to just get up here and talk horror stories. But believe me, there was so much insanity in the prison system. You had to live and act abnormal. If you didn't, then you were being abnormal. And this was where you had to try to stay and get your mind together. 
the racial stuff in the prison with the administration was unbelievable. Black prisoners were kept dispersed across the prison system. They didn't have a cell block with just black prisoners or a group of black prisoners. They had it broken down that Shorty would be in another, another cell block and his friend in this cell block. They wouldn't allow more than, what, five or six in a block? But this is the problem. Corrections is not about corrections, it's about job security. And we had the opportunity to straighten it out. The problem is corrections, prisons are wrong in concept, they're wrong in application, they don't work. <coughs> and our solution is abolish them. And I don't mean, <laughs> I don't mean just open the door and throw everybody out. I mean, there are some people in there that are seriously sick individuals. They don't belong in the prison. They belong in a mental institution, not Bridgewater, but a mental, an institution that has professional people. They do more damage to a person, putting them in the prison system you, it, it's just so complicated trying mm -hmm. to explain it to you, and it's just coming up inside me again. You know, been there, done it, and watch too many people get really hurt. And that the institution read this book, I, and you're going to be amazed. They never challenged this book. And that's the thing to keep in mind. They never said anything about what we said in this book. They should have sued us. You sue everybody else. <laughs> so um, I want to ask Albert real quick. Um, you had mentioned when we were talking earlier the other day mm -hmm. about um, Bantu okay. and how that was important for you. And so I just wanted you to have an opportunity because there were certain organizations that helped I think. Considerably, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, well, Bantu, believe it or not, and APRA are hand in hand. But Bantu primarily dealt with the black population. So what Ralph and, and them knew was that a lot of the young black inmates had no knowledge of self, none whatsoever, or of their culture, or their history, none. So it was important that they begin to try to uh, get programming in there that would um, apprise people of that. Another thing was they had to get all the black population to unify together. Because as long as we was like Bobby said, two in this block, two in that block, three in that block, we could get picked off. We were vulnerable, but together, we were strong, but we had to convince black inmates of that, you know, because they, you know, I mean, after a while, they began to see that it was dangerous and that uh, the uh, power was in the numbers. We got to get together, not to make noise, but be able to protect ourselves and do for ourselves. And um, we ate together. We, we um, now during a lot of this time, when they fed us, the administration, they fed us some horrible stuff. And, and so we fed each other, black and white. And during this period of time, I think it was every three months or every six months, your families could bring you eight boxes of food from the streets. Amen. Eight boxes. So that would be canned goods of stuff that you wouldn't normally get. That would be cosmetics. So we stacked these canned goods because there were going to be days when we knew, like, when the administration would feed us, they would come through with their bare hands, reach in the loaf of bread, take four slices of bread with their bare hands and stick it on your bars and say, here. I said, man, I don't want that. And I'd knock it off. You got your hands on my bread? Where's your gloves? You know, and they would cuss me out and call me the N-word or whatever. And like he said, they put all kind of stuff in our food. Well, we fed each other. Everybody made sure every, nobody was going hungry. Just yell out. If you're hungry, yell out. 
You know, our favorite thing was, was, um, uh, what was it, the fish in the can, the vegetarian beans, and the fried rice. That was a meal. <laughs> a can of fried rice and a little can of vegetarian beans and a little salmon, that was a meal. That was a delicacy. You know, so <laughs> everybody had that. And, 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 and we tried to look out for each other. Uh, another example, somebody's, uh, in, in a community, some woman's house burnt down. We didn't know the woman, but somebody in this institution knew her. We took a collection from all the inmates and sent her the money. Mm -hmm. About clothes for her kids. But, and every time we tried to do something for the community, the administration would go out their way to try to block it. And they would, they would take money from us. Uh, what was it? The, um, it was one of the, not the tsunamis, but an uh, uh, earthquake or something. And we sent money. I mean, we put money together. Administration sent it in the name of DOC. <laughs> so we never got, they never knew it came from, you know, you know from the prison. So, so I wanted to. One second. Go ahead. We set up an education program. And I can't think of the name. We got a $50,000 grant. To, we paid for a teacher. And one inmate got $75 a month because he was the secretary, kept the record and stuff. A bank was going to give us a million and a half. They locked the prison down and went to the bank and said, they are locked down and they're not getting out. Give us <laughs> the money. And the bank told the Department of Correction, no, the money goes either to the prisoners or nobody gets it. But we had to set up an education program. We had stuff set up so, I mean, if you saw it, right, you'd riot. But you know, we set up a program that worked. We proved for, what was it, 12 weeks? Yeah, 12 weeks. That we ran the prison, nobody got hurt. Nobody overdosed. We had good control of what was going on, and the Department of Corrections should have jumped on our side of the equation and pushed it. We know how to rehabilitate prisoners. That's the crunch. We know how to rehabilitate people. They don't have a vested interest in rehabilitating prisoners. It's job security. It's that simple. That's the problem. We have to abolish the prison system, and we have to do it in a sane, rational manner and train it. Let's, for an example, we can teach a prisoner masonry, electricity, what else? The, the, um, well, and welding. welding. You got the welding and stuff. Something that they could go on the street and make a living wage. They won't allow it. They got 20 computers into the prison system in Old Colony. Five of them were stolen by staff before we even got it. And the institution and the Department of Corrections said, we have a rehabilitative program. We're teaching about computers. Bullshit. We can get rid of the prison system, and we have to get rid of it. There's a lot of people that should never went through the front door to begin with. And then there were people, I mean, this guy kills his mother, his <coughs> father, his brother. That's not rational, sane human behavior. This is a mental individual that belongs in a mental institution, humane, not a Bridgewater type institution. And that's how he's going to live. Let me, um, Ed, you were trying to get in, I think, but I also wanted to pose um, support for, I want to talk about families. We we'll talk about um, that, and so Ed, I didn't know how what the ad hoc committee uh, did in support of the families. 
Was there anything there? We have organized uh, the women and, you know, close Family friends mm -hmm. of the prisoners into an organization called Family and Friends of Prisoners. And they took on the responsibility of providing that companionship, day-to-day -day communication, and otherwise being real brothers and sisters to the prisoners. Uh, and the whole thing would not have worked had it not been for the family and friends group that, like in many organizations, was really run by the women. So I take my hat off to them and say they were the ones that were the backbone of the struggle. And if they had allowed it to really blossom and become an institution on its own right, I think a lot of the humanity could have been restored and Walpole would not have degenerated into the hellhole that it ultimately became. And to misinterpret the importance of that family connection is to miss what is really important about building humanity and building genuine rehabilitation because it has to be based on the human interaction between husbands and wives, children, and grandparents who often were the ones who had to be the stalwart support of the prisoners if the families had to work. So in general, it was a real community effort. And the institution never appreciated the importance of that community building and eventually shut it down. So that's my one regret that you couldn't have the kind of genuine human interaction there's one story that I'll tell, and that'll be the last contribution I'll make, is that there was a point in time when we had three-way meetings, guards, prisoners, and, in, and, you know, the regular population. And when we were having discussions about various concerns, there came a point where half the guards and half the prisoners were on different sides of the issue. And I remember watching the guards watching that and they kind of nodded at each other and the whole thing was shut down the next day because they could not allow that solidarity to emerge and develop because at the end of the day, they were all in the same place facing the same problems. And there was no reason why they couldn't come to common solutions. And that was the real loss, that and the connection with the families that took the human element out of it and returned it to an institution. Very sad. Albert, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the families if you want, but also I think Ed hit on what crumbled it was the guards, right? The administration. And well, those they, final can't, days. they cannot allow rehabilitation to take place in the system or they have no job. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. That no unity. Um, Back then, we were under Health and Human Services yeah. rehabilitation. It was supposed to be about all the money was going to rehabilitation. Of course, it's under public safety now, so they're not even thinking about rehabilitation. Um, but even then, 
I remember this. I remember being at um, Shirley, uh, uh, Shirley, and they had the, the um, officer training program. Oh, security prison. The academy. Yeah, uh, the officer training academy. So you see all the new officers coming in to be trained. We would be sitting on the lawn, maybe with our visitors or whatever, and maybe 30 of them would run by, and they would have a drill, a, G, uh, a drill instructor, and he would say, he, he would see a car, and he would go, car, and they would all go, car, he would see a bird, he'd go, bird, and they would all say, bird, and then he would see us, and he would point, enemies, and they would all go, enemies, so, which told me then and there, they were teaching them hate against us right from the start, so before they even became uh, officers, they were taught to hate us. You know, for no reason. We hadn't did anything to these people. Now, the analogy is this. Everybody knows what a, a chihuahua is or, or a toy poodle. These are cute little dogs. Cute little dogs that are meek and mild. And if you approach them too enthusiastically, they may start leaking and, and trembling. But you can take the same little dog, put them in a, make a little cage. Stick them in the cage. And every day, stick a ruler in the cage and smack them. Pop! What do you think is going to happen three or four days down? He's going to be growling. See, that, the way they treated, treated him changed him. And that's what they were trying to do to us. Treat us like pieces of nothing. And, and I'm not going to front. Some of us did feed and act like that, meaning rage, anger, until we found out until we dug what was going on. Oh, we gotta stop feeding. We gotta stop feeding. They know how to push our buttons and we react. We gotta stop being reactionary. That's Bobby. You know, he was the general. He said, <laughs> that's what we called him, the general. What do we do now, general? <laughs> he said, don't say that too loud. <laughs> but um, um, the most important thing to a prisoner is his family or loved ones. Or whoever he has, most important thing, you know, there's God first, family, then community. Um, if if you uh, you know observe like that, and um, so every uh, the administration didn't establish any programs for us at that time. All they established was security. So when they told Bobby and them, or when Bobby and them pitched to them, it was like um, brother back there, Lacey. Ani King, they were instrumental in, in programming, and especially in the black population. But we know we could do better. We needed that leadership. We needed the direction. And so every program that was put together included family. So your families could come in and participate. Um, family awareness, families could come in. And everybody get in a circle, your family and you, and everybody go around the room and everybody meet. My, my mother gets to meet your mother. My sister gets to meet your sister. Or my girl gets to meet your girl. And that's how the family and friends that Reverend Ed was just talking about was established. Family and friends of prisoners were, were, were prisoners' families. Um, and so families was, was the most important aspect. And, and we were OK with that. Um, uh, your families are the people who got your back, are the people who care about you the most, who look out for you. And so um, even though the administration would say, yeah, you all go ahead and do this and do that, but not really mean it. And then when we get ready to go do whatever it was, we find out that it was BS. And then we would regroup, reevaluate, and, and do whatever we had to do. But. Um, um, but there was two things the gods never messed with back then. Your family or your food. Because they know we would yeah. tear the place up. Mess with my family, we'll tear this place up. Everybody. It, it didn't matter whether you were white or black. If they mess with your mama or your grandmother or your kids out there in a disrespectful, far way, we, we all step to it. And so um, mm -hmm. we did all right you know, until things changed. My family basically died all around me. And I was never allowed to go to the funeral for anybody, my mother or my brother, nobody. And that kind of motivated me for escaping because it got- Oh, you're going to talk about that. 
<laughs> you know, like you can just take it for so long and you say, oh, that's it. I'm going to risk my life. You, I used to tell gods, listen, do you see me go over the wall? Shoot. Don't wound me. You know, don't put me in a wheelchair. Make sure you hit me in the bubble. I mean, yeah, he's crazy. Yeah, he is. <laughs> I want to, um, you know, we're about 15 minutes to the end. I wanted to be able to have an opportunity for the audience, y'all, if you had any questions for this panel that we have here. Um, and so uh, if you do, raise your hand. And, uh, come on, come on, folks. Yeah. Come on, come on, wherever you are. <laughs> I'm really amazed at the length of everybody's hair because I thought when you went to jail or prison, they would shave your hair. So why is it that you guys had so much hair? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to answer? You want me to answer? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well. No, that, in some, I guess some prisons, they do that. But we didn't have to cut our hair. Matter of fact, we refused to get out of here. I mean, we went to the barbershop when we wanted to, you know, to uh, get um, a haircut. And uh, everybody tried to look decent and have a decent appearance, you know, for the most part. But no, we weren't, we weren't forced to shave our, our heads. Yes, ma'am. All the time. They search every place on you. <laughs> Bend uh, and, over and spread them. Uh, was one of the famous. <laughs> and uh, what they did was, one time they, they did something to somebody's grandmother. It was Bobby Prince. And, and, the, and the inmate came in in tears, ripping. Because he couldn't, because I guess the grandmother got the, the, the officer's name, who stripped her. Told her to strip and squat over a mirror and cough. So, I mean, I would have blew my top. When I heard it, I blew my top. So we all shut the joint down again about this one incident. And how it ended up was, we said, you don't touch our families. You want to strip somebody, strip us. And that's how we got, began to get stripped. We did that to ourselves. We said, don't touch our, our families. You want to strip somebody, strip us. She's coming to me. If she's bringing me something, then that means I got it. So when I get to go in, you get to strip me and you get to find it. You know, but leave our families, our kids alone. And, and, and they respected that for a number of years. Today they don't. You know, today it's anything uh, that goes. And, and just, I hope I'm not going off. For an example, you know, um, prisons today are about money and nothing else. It's a corporation about money. You'd be, you would be surprised to know who owns a private prison because it's all guaranteed money. And so I just left Norfolk. You pay $4.99 for 24 bottles of water. I paid $12.99 for the same 24 bottles of water. So the prices are inflated that much, and it's not criminal. I'm like, why am I paying 12, almost $13 for 24 bottles of water? When in, when in the free world, you only pay $4.99 for it. So everything is, 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 is sky high. Color TV. A 13-inch color television costs over $300 in the prison system. A black and white 12-inch screen is $100. You can buy that for 20 bucks anywhere. But what they did is they went out, the radios, the televisions, the writing pens, everything is clear plastic now. So you can't go to Sony, you can't go to uh, um, you know, any major uh, 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 television store. You have to go to what's it, security. Go yeah. so, so when you order your TV for $300, it's the cheapest TV going. You don't even get the remote. It's see-through. They want it see-through so they can see inside the TV, make sure ain't nothing hidden in it. And the speaker is cut. 
So, so your speaker is cut, so you yeah, have to have a headphone in order to hear the TV. Uh, but every item in there is like that. They make big money off of that. Sitting in fans, and everything breaks like this, so you have to buy it again, and buy it again, and buy it again. So the money, you go, you go to the plate shop and get 35 cents a day. Then you get robbed of that money when you go to the canteen. And I used to go in the canteen, and I would say, I'd like to report a robbery. <laughs> and they would say, what? I said, I'd like to report. You all just robbed me today. You know, I said. <laughs> Again. You know. Do we have another question? <clears throat> oh, we okay, got a bunch of them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It goes back and then the front. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, for those of you who spent more time after um, the events at Walpole in the prison system, what would you say changed the most over the years? You mentioned that now everything's plastic and see-through, but in terms of the experience for you as the outside world changed, what changed inside and what has stayed the same? Ooh, that's a hard question. Uh, Walpole, I don't know if you've seen it in the news media, Walpole's being phased out. I, I mean, that's like a major change. And why is it being phased out? It's about money. It cost $22 million to rewire the place. Then another 30, 000, 30 million for some other crazy shit. We got to abolish the prison system, folks. And I'll tell you, they sent me to Marion, Illinois twice. Uh, yeah. hmm. I finally got back to Massachusetts, felt tip pens, all the office type material. Walpole had all that again. Where did that come from? NIC, the National Institution of Corrections. It's a federal agency and it is the puppet master. States have to dance to the tune of NIC or they don't get federal money. It's all about money. We don't need the prison system. People that got to get lost. Got <clears throat> individuals that I met in the prison system that understood that they couldn't survive on the street. Like uh, Stoney, I was helping him with his case, and we had everything that was possibly available to argue the case. And I said, you know, just file the motion. I said, you got it. You know, there's there's no more information. This is it. And he said, I don't want to go on the street. And I said, huh? He said, Bobby, I can't go on the street. I kill things out there. Whoa. So, oh, listen, we got to do this here. We got to research this and that. And I've run into maybe three or four guys that this was the thing. We had that guy, black kid in the uh, metal shop. They wanted to give him a pardon. He wanted an exoneration. He made it so outrageous that they wouldn't go along with it and they would deny him. That's what he wanted. He didn't want to go near the street. He was in jail for like 60 years. This is an insane asylum, the concept of prisons. It's wrong in concept, it's wrong in application, it's wrong to its core. And it's a big disservice to society to be throwing money down that rat hole. And these people, like I said, we know how to rehabilitate prisoners. So, I know, um, anybody else want to answer that question? I'd like to get to two or three more questions. Okay, we have uh, and the other, the, other, the other change is this. Um, back in the day, there was four prisons. Walpole, Norfolk, Concord, and Bridgewater. Framingham. And Framingham. It was five prisons. Mm -hmm. well, well, 
At the beginning of the 80s, the middle of the 80s, they built like 11 more prisons in Massachusetts. Before they, before they even had people to put in them. They had the buildings built because they knew they were going to go out and arrest people. That's Don't right. worry about it. We got somebody to put in there. I was in the yard one day. Okay. I was smoking a joint in the yard. I thought I was by myself. I looked up and I saw a bunch of cops and a bunch of people in suits. So I hides the joint and I'm looking and guess who it was? The commissioner of the Boston police and the commissioner of corrections. I was like, oh, but I wasn't close enough to hear the conversation. I said, what could that conversation be about? Commissioner of the police and the commissioner of corrections and they was pointing over here to some vacant land on the prison. And sure enough, they built up, uh, they extended and built more cells right in that spot. So they knew then this prison construction boom was coming across the nation, not just in Boston. They were going to put people in prison because it was about money. And, you know, uh, 40 years, at say 80000 a year. Do the math. 40 years. So you, the taxpayers, paid $80,000 every year for 40 years for me to be in prison. Hell, you could have gave me 40 and sent me to, uh, uh, to Curry College and, we, and, 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 and saved all the rest of that money. <laughs> you know, so it was just a waste of money. And any time they want people to, to uh, be down with this crime thing, come election time, who's ever running, we'll talk about crime. And you see crime on the news. You don't see no crime. Only when they want you know, people to, to look that way. And um, the other change was was right now, as we speak, in our day, it was, it was a black and white population. The NPRA was made of, of nine white guys, nine black, and three Spanish. That, that was the 21 members. Nobody else. And, and one of the Spanish guys wasn't Spanish. He was gay right there. But so it wasn't, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right now, everybody is in prison. Every ethnic people you can think of is in Norfolk right now. Everyone. And uh, so th that's the change. And a lot of them, some of them are doing better in prison in America than they did in their own country in the free world. You get that? They're doing better in prison than they, than they did in the free world in their own country. Of course, they want to go to work and send money back to their country. If you send money to Dominican Re Republic from Walpole, that money's going to triple 14 times. So I get it. I wish I was Dominican. I've been sending my little dimes back, too. But um, those are the two, the two vast differences. The population and the... Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's one up front, the question. OK, there, and then, and then final one would be over here. OK. Sorry, the question I had was going back to the, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, what's so extraordinary about the story to some extent is the degree of organization. As you say, there was a committee of, of 21. There was so many groups. There's an amazing degree of u unity. Um, and obviously that had to grow from something, partly the organization you're talking about, but how did that come about? And, and obviously, the administration ever since has systematically destroyed any such organization. Um, but it was, a, going back to what, what gave you so much um, hope and strength and unity to, to, to get that organization together. So the year that the prisoners took over Walpole, prison book program started 50 years ago, just down the street in Central Square on River Street. They are still going strong. Last year, they sent out 36,000 books to people nationwide who are locked up in prisons, not jails, in prisons. And so I'm inviting everybody, if you have loved ones in prison, go to the website, prisonbookprogram.org to find out how your people can get books free of charge. 
Thank you very, very much for this. I think you've enlightened every single person in this room, and I look forward to tomorrow. There's one more question over here. You had your hand up? Were you? I don't want to miss you. you know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, this is really uh, thrilling for me. I've, I actually first read about you, Mr. DeLello, when I was um, 14 years old uh, <laughs> and uh, wrote a, a paper about Walpole. Um, it was the first time I had done any research at all, and it was, uh, it was really important in my life. But um, I was wondering, uh, this is slightly later than 1973, uh, after the, the movement, um, I know in 1978, there was an administration change here in Massachusetts, and there was administration change at the Department of Corrections, and a lot of things happened at Walpole, including an incident where um, a large number of, of, um, of um, people in the prison were taken out in the middle of the night and shipped off to federal penitentiaries, I believe, Lewisburg. Um, and I was just wondering if you were, you were there at that time. Um, I and was if, one of the first that got shipped to the federal system. <laughs> it, on that night? Do you, uh, do you, under, under Bill Hogan? Well, they, they came into the cell. I was in segregation, and they came in with street clothes and said, here, that ain't mine. They said, it is now. <laughs> and three guards drove me all the way to Illinois, to Marion, Illinois, twice. Um, I, I think there, there was a particular incident where it was um, the middle of the night, and they brought in uh, the administration shipped out I think I think twelve people, and turned on all the lights and brought in dogs and riot gear. Yeah, yeah. That's how they come in. Yeah, and um, I I just had always wondered and was never able to find out at the age of fourteen uh, <laughs> if that was connected to to the union uh, movement. Absolutely, yeah. indirectly. Um, good indirectly is a good word. Is it indirectly is a good word? Um, because those guys were leaders, most of them, in some capacity, were leaders, and for the most part, weren't troublemakers. And the reason why they were shipped was because of their leadership, and, and they didn't want them to influence the younger inmates. For an example, they, they drew a yellow line down the middle of the floor oh, yeah. and told the young guys, don't step over that line. Now, the old guys like me who've been there, we're like, what? You step over the line. And so when I asked one of the officers, what's this yellow line about? He said it was, um, what do you call it? What's the word? Indoctrination. For the, so we told the young guys, step over the line, man. Step, you got to have some autonomy over your life. Um, you got to dictate to this situation. You can't let somebody else dictate or the outside forces dictate because you, you don't know where you're liable to wind up. And um, they did that. So when they saw they needed to remove some of the leaders, get them out, get them out and keep getting them out. They needed a reason to do so. And of course, they didn't say because, because we were um, uh, teaching the young inmates. Of course, they said something crazy like uh, behavioral problems. At this point, guys wasn't having behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. um, I want to take this time. Can you all just show some love to <laughs> Albert, Bobby, and Ed? Yeah.